everyone has habits they swear keep them young. I exercise every day. I eat lots of fruits and vegetables, and I try not to get stressed out over things. I do what she does, but also I drink a multivitamin kale shake in the morning, do the daily crossword in pen, and take two fish oil tablets. Okay, all pretty reasonable, but some people take it farther. What are my tricks for staying young? Well, there's my anti-aging cream during the day and my advanced rejuvenating serum at night. Plus, I drink resveratrol shakes, and I also plug in my Super Omega-3 IV drip and pop a good handful of L-alpha glycerol phosphoryl choline pills, which strengthen my brain tissue. Unless they're for constipation. I can't remember. Either way, they are good. I got my caloric intake down to 400 a day, and at night, I sleep upside down like a bat to iron out wrinkles, because gravity can't outfox me. Unless it's one of those fox bats. So we'll go to extreme lengths to stop the march of time, but we may be prepared to go even farther. I'm Molly Bentley. I'm Seth Shostak, and welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where scientists investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology, and we're going to investigate how both are being recruited in the age-old battle against old age. How far are you willing to go to stay the same? Here's a true story. In the late 19th century, a French surgeon of Russian extraction, Sergei Voronov, dedicated himself to developing a therapy to help him stay young and retain his virility. His work was based on the theory that hormones, specifically testosterone produced by the testes of young animals, would rejuvenate an older body. And his plan was to inject himself with a solution of dog and guinea pig testicles. Here I am in my lab where I'm going to take this beaker of crushed animal testes and this syringe. Then I'm going to roll up my sleeve and... Yeah, yeah you know what? This story is plenty vivid already. Why don't you guys just take it away? Okay, so uh, Sergei Voronov takes crushed up animal testicles and injects them. But they didn't have the elixir properties he'd hoped for. In fact, they don't do much of anything except make for some pretty resentful dogs and guinea pigs. And speaking of such things, for his next round of experiments, Sergei found other volunteers to use as guinea pigs to test his novel therapy. He refined his idea by suggesting that what was required was a closer relationship with testicular tissue. His plan now was to graft monkey testicles onto human male volunteers. He thought that this could extend the human lifespan up to 140 years. The first monkey gland to human transplant took place in 1920. Again, the idea was that the men would have improved virility and be generally rejuvenated in mind and in body. So by the time of the Great Depression, more than 500 men had received Sergei's monkey gland therapy, even though there was no proof whatsoever that it made the men younger. In fact, in many volunteers, complications arose. In the end, the experiments stopped, the reputation and career of Sergei Voronov languished, and eventually he disappeared from the scene. But here's the thing. What he was doing sounds extreme, right? But although his bizarre and gruesome xenotransplantation experiments wouldn't be done today, Sergei Voronov's story illustrates just how far we're willing to go to prevent aging. And today we're just as passionate about stopping the wrath of the wrinkles, the, the challenge of the liver spots, the prunification of the populace. Major research labs are devoted to using the tools of modern science to beat the clock.
In some ways, we're like Oliver Twist, wanting more when it comes to stopping aging. For our Savannah-dwelling ancestors, turning 25 would have been a remarkable feat. The mortality rate at birth would have been very high. And then science, medicine, and engineering gave us clean water, sewers, sanitation, antibiotics, vaccines, and knowledge to treat disease. Today, the average global life expectancy is 71 years, according to the United Nations. But we want to go beyond that. And geneticist Gordon Lithgow hopes he, his lab, and all the scientists at the Buck Institute for Researching on Aging will help extend not just the number of years we live, but how many of them are going to be spent in good health. So, Gordon, um, we're speaking at about 1.30 in the afternoon on a Monday. When does aging start? Uh, about 1.45. <laughs> um, that's a great question. When does aging start? And it, it used to be a simple answer, and that would be aging would start at the point at which we become a reproductive adult. You know, once you get past that development stuff and you're fully grown, you can think of aging starting then. But actually, I think it's a bit more complicated because we're beginning to learn that really early life events and the kind of things we're exposed to very early in life, including in the womb, can have an effect on aging much later in life. So I think the answer is conception. You've been quoted as saying that we should think of the diseases of aging the way that we thought of childhood diseases in the past. And what do you mean by that? Is, is aging a disease? Well, here's the thing. Aging is the largest risk factor for almost all human chronic diseases. Think of adult cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, osteoarthritis, and so on. There's a great plethora of very different kinds of diseases. All have aging as the largest risk factor. Now, some scientists, even conservative scientists like myself, are beginning to get to the point where we're thinking of age not so much as just a risk factor, but as a cause. Now, that at first sounds quite unlikely. How can you have a single cause for, say, Alzheimer's and cancer? They're completely different diseases happening in different tissues, very different in their nature, treated in different ways, of course, and have different outcomes. But if you look back at childhood diseases at the beginning of, say, the 19th century, those were very different diseases, uh, all presented in different ways and all were treated in different ways. Think of polio and tuberculosis, for example. But of course, we eventually worked out that all of those diseases, mumps, rubella, measles, everything else, they all had a single cause, and that was microbes, viruses, and bacteria. So an, an infection. An infection. And with that, you can come up with very general strategies to overcome or prevent those diseases, like antibiotics and, and vaccines. And so we might be at a point, kind of like at the point of discovery of antibiotics or vaccines, where we're beginning to understand there's a general principle at play here. There's some central mechanism or mechanisms in aging that's causing very diverse kinds of diseases. When I came into this field, I had no interest in, in human disease. In fact, I didn't even really think about aging and disease as going together. It was, we're studying aging. No, we're not studying that messy stuff that goes wrong. We're studying this process called aging, this underlying process. And, you know, you had examples. I mean, you, you have the centenarians and the super centenarians that reach 110, 120 almost. Those people are aging and for the most part are disease free. So yeah, you had examples there of aging somehow separated from disease. But it's not true. For the vast, vast, vast bulk of people, aging and disease go hand in hand. I came into this just interested in biology. And then we've gone through this phase where we go, oh, well, you know what? The biology is telling us that aging and disease are really the same mechanistic ball of string. If that's the case, maybe we're at a point in history where we could th start thinking of simple principles that allow us to develop cures or preventions for a whole host of chronic diseases in late life. Can you give an example of what that one, that singular cause might be, or at least what some of the contenders are? Well, there, there are many contenders. For example, we're interested in the role of telomeres, the end of chromosomes, and they have a, certainly have a role in cell aging. These are the tips of the end of the, the chromosomes end, that we right. find as we get older, they get shorter. And they shorter. get shorter and they get shorter as we are stressed as well. So it's, it's an indicator of, of general health. But there are many other players. There's stem cell functions, the cells that replenish damaged cells in our body. That pool of stem cells seem to become more difficult as we get older. They seem to be less able to replicate and, and produce new cells. And we have accumulation of various sorts of damage in cells. Our DNA becomes damaged, meaning that the genes are not as precisely regulated as they should be during aging. 
and we have an accumulation of, for example, damaged protein or unfolded protein as we age. And that, that seems to be a, a major player that many labs are really interested in looking at right now. I understand that this is speculative, but is the idea that, say, you could prevent telomeres from getting shorter, and then that would solve some of those other problems, the problems with proteins unfolding or the problems with stem cells not regenerating and so forth? One of the biggest challenges right now is to link the, the quite different aspects of aging that scientists are studying. And of course, everyone thinks that they're studying the most important process. Of course, that's what you work on what you think is the most important. But there's a diverse range of scientists studying aging, and we're looking at aging at different levels from molecular through the hormonal to the tissue. And one of the, the most challenging features right now is how do we bring all those things together? into a coherent paradigm, if you like, of what aging is. We see that things change during aging at every single level, molecular to tissue to whole animal, and exactly how those levels talk to each other or how tissues talk to each other, we're just really beginning to understand. So it appears that tissues communicate with each other during aging as well, and a really good example is exercise. So, for example, if you do resistance training, even a moderate amount of resistance training, of course, you see improvement in muscle function. But you also see improvement in cognition. And this is really stunning that you can exercise one tissue and apparently see benefits across the body. And it's similar when we think about different aging mechanisms. It's likely that different kinds of aging mechanisms, such as protein damage, DNA damage, stem cell function, they communicate in certain ways. And this, I think, is how we are able to make laboratory animals live longer is we're able to come in and in very different kinds of interventions improve the health of the whole animal for longer. Now why is it exercise and not say sitting around on a couch eating donuts? Are you sure that that's been ruled out as a way to <laughs> extend lifespan? Um, fairly sure oh. that that that's not going to work. In fact, as you know, what's driving the uh, the enormous potential drops in life expectancy in this country is is just that kind of behavior, I'm sorry to say. Let's look at one of the specific pathways that you're working on, and I know you've worked on many, but this is the idea, and you mentioned it earlier, about proteins. You're looking at proteins in the lab, and you're looking at their failure to fold at some point, or they unfold at some point. Is, mm. is that right? Can you give us an overview of what sure. these folding, these origami proteins have to do yeah. with us getting older? Well, of course, you know, we, we take in dietary proteins and we break those down to amino acids and then we build up our own proteins which we use to do work, enzymes for example that undertake uh, metabolism. So proteins have a three-dimensional shape and that shape's absolutely critical for their function. You can think about the shape of a cup, you know, you have to be cup shaped to hold water, you know. Yeah. Paper shaped for example doesn't work as well. Correct, that's right, that's right. And actually if we take the analogy further, if you imagine taking a paper cup and crumpling it so it's no longer cup shape. That's very much like what happens during normal aging to a number of our proteins. Now we've known this for quite a while in relation to neurological disease. There are very specific proteins that become misfolded and start behaving badly and start aggregating and dropping out of solution. And some of those proteins are associated with Alzheimer's disease and with Parkinson's disease. But more recently, we've been asking whether this is a general feature of proteins many other proteins in the cell and it turns out it is that you know both worms which we study in the lab tiny microscopic worms and flies and it looks like mice as well all accumulate damaged protein during normal aging and this actually provides a connection between normal aging and these neurological diseases it's possible that alzheimer's is really kind of like a natural process is part of the normal aging process. It's just that it becomes accelerated in particular people in particular circumstances so and what, manifests as a disease. So what you want to figure out is why it is that these proteins collapse on themselves or unfold. Yes, and we, we would like to understand why they unfold, but we also need to understand what are the intrinsic repair mechanisms. And it turns out there are many, many ways of removing damaged protein. We have in our cells the proteasomal functions which break down proteins. We have a process called autophagy where proteins are maintained in vesicles and, and thrown out of the cell essentially. So we, we have all sorts of different defense systems. And it turns out that many of the interventions that we use in the lab to extend lifespan of simple laboratory animals, we think tap into some of these processes. It's not so much that the intervention itself is slowing aging, more that it's accelerating the capacity of the animal to remove damage. And when we do that, we see an increase in health and we see an increase in lifespan. Is your goal, or the goal of researchers, and maybe they're, maybe they're different, is it to delay aging or do away with aging altogether? Well, um, 
different scientists will definitely say different things. They generally aren't motivated to live forever. I guess a couple are. They are motivated though, when they look at the state of, of human health as we get past 65 and, and on. I think anyone who takes a walk through a geriatric psychiatric ward would come out the other end thinking, if we could do something about that, we should. What we've seen in the lab though, is that aging is malleable. It's not an absolute, it doesn't have to happen at the rates it happens. But that's with flies and worms it is, and it is. mice, not with humans, right? Is it, that's isn't right. it an, another level or, or many orders of complexity when you talking about changing aging in humans? Yeah, it probably is many orders of complexity more difficult. But once you've got the principles, you know, I mean, say the same biochemical process that drives aging in a worm is driving aging in ourselves. If you have one or two biochemical processes that are key, they are common to life, not to a particular species. And whilst all the species will have their own idiosyncrasies about aging, if there are central processes that in common, then we can find them and we can find them in worms and flies and we can apply that knowledge to humans. And I think we have an opportunity to improve human health. We'll hear more from Gordon Lithgow in a moment when we go to his lab and meet some worms that may help humans live longer. The thing I like about this is that we've recognized that disease in the past, it was always due to something like, you know, he says bacteria, uh, it's due to viruses, things like that. But the idea that the aging process is a disease causer, I mean, that was kind of a new insight. Yes, although it requires that you accept what you have in common with worms and flies and other animals. Are you prepared to do that? Yeah, well, a lot of people point out that the resemblance between me and a worm, but, <laughs> but more than that, I mean... Because you're down to earth? Yes, I am down to earth. I can dig it. The thing is that, that we're actually working on these problems that people are saying, look, this isn't hopeless. All the things that go wrong. And he gave a whole litany of things that go wrong. He said, you know, maybe we can unravel these one by one. And when you solve one problem, you actually solve other problems. The fact that if you exercise, that improves cognition. Fantastic. Exactly. The idea that all the tissue is connected. And so you can be treating one area of the body and the other parts of the body respond as well. It's very encouraging. So we've been hearing about how scientists are trying to extend our lives by tackling these diseases that come with old age, but later we'll talk about more radical measures we could take so that we can all enjoy our 100th birthday and beyond. It's Raising the Minimum Age on Big Picture Science. Support for Big Picture Science comes from Google. The Making and Science team wants to spark the curiosity of aspiring makers and scientists, encouraging them to explore the world around them, to tinker and build things, and to have fun doing it. Learn more at makingscience.withgoogle.com. We heard from geneticist Gordon Lithgow that animals share some basic biology. So the biochemical processes that cause aging in worms, for example, may cause aging in you. And worms are Dr. Lithgow's lab rats. He wants to find out why the healthy functioning of the worm's protein breaks down. And as he explained, it could be key to stopping other degenerative processes. So could worms have the key to the fountain of youth? Well, if so, it's a tiny fountain the worm that Dr. Lithgow and his researchers study is called C. elegans, and it's a silly millimeter in length. Even so, the transparent nematode is a kind of rock star among the white lab coat set. It's widely used as a model organism to study basic biology. Its natural habitat is dirt, but here C. elegans is living the cool lab life. Well, we're now in Gordon's lab and we've walked into a room where there are many refrigerators and do I want to know what's in these refrigerators? Oh, you absolutely want to know. So we work on a tiny little roundworm called C. elegans, it's a millimeter in length. And what you're looking at here is a C. elegans housing project. So this is not a refrigerator, but an incubator that keeps the temperature constant. So is the C on the um, refrigerator there for C. elegans or for Celsius? Celsius, that's Celsius, yeah. When we open the fridge, you'll see there's a whole bunch of plastic boxes and inside the plastic boxes, you'll see these round plates. 
and the worms are essentially growing on these plates and each of these plates even though it's just about an inch in diameter contains hundreds of these individual C. elegans. May I see one? Can I hold one? Yes, of course. Okay, so I'm holding this dish. Ooh. Oh. <gasps> okay, the top just fell. Did, did we just lose some no, worms? It's fine. Oh no. gosh. <laughs> I, okay, now I'm I'm sort of shaky. Yeah, so, so just hold it like that. Yeah, okay, hold I'll hold it, it so this you're way. One finger on top, one above. <gasps> okay. I really hope that no worms <laughs> fell onto the floor. So sorry, I'm not used to doing this. Sort of a uh, murky yellow gelatinous substance and you're telling me that there are worms in there that may hold some of the secrets to how we age? Absolutely. So we've been studying the, the aging of these worms for over 20 years now and we know hundreds and hundreds of genes that determine how long it lives. So the normal worm lives about 20 days but different genetic mutants live anywhere from 40 days to 100 days. So they really are quite remarkable. Hi Manish. Hey. <laughs> So Manish uh, is a postdoctoral researcher, recently joined the lab, and he's sitting at a microscope. There's light coming up from the base through one of the agar plates containing worms and up into the eyepieces. And he is holding a small uh, glass pipette with a wire, a platinum wire, and he's using that wire to move the worms from plate to plate, to count them, to find out how many are alive and dead. And over the course of a month, Manish can find out if a compound or some other intervention is slowing aging in these animals. May I look into the into the eyepiece here? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. No, will I see a worm? Yeah, you can see. Yeah, if you look into the eyepieces, you can definitely see the worm. Let me focus it for you. Oh my gosh. Can you see that? Like yes, I absolutely can. Right. On the corner right hand side, you can see like the very aged population. It's a single worm. It's almost like non-motile. That's a 24 day worm. It's not moving. So this is an old worm. This is a very old worm, yeah. Do you get attached to the worms? Do you feel like you come yeah, to know them? Def- yeah, they are my favorite, definitely. I've been working them for like almost six years now. So these animals, are young adults. Okay, so Um, I'm about to look at the young worms. Yes, and you'll see that they're very motile, swimming around. That's exactly what they're doing. They're moving around just like you would expect, say, an eel in water, perhaps? Yes, and they they get their name C. elegans from the elegant sort of sinusoidal movement. They're really quite pretty. How do you study proteins in in these worms? And how do you finally... (laughs) How do you extract the proteins in these animals? Well, um, we grow large quantities of these animals and and we have to break them up. So we we do a protein extract. We extract the proteins, total cellular proteins from these worms. And then we have a protocol that purifies those proteins that are altered in shape and become insoluble. And so we can visualize that in, in different ways on gels, but also by mass spectroscopy, we can identify what those proteins are and we can quantitate the proteins. So we can get a very accurate picture of what proteins get into trouble during normal aging and it turns out it's proteins from all over the cell and from different tissues as well this is a widespread proteomic wide process of protein damage Manesh, finally, how many worms do you think you've seen in your work as a scientist? Want to, can you put a like figure on it? In my six years, I can't even count them. It's like billions, 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 more than that. Yeah, <laughs> so I can't really count them. I have seen like many, many. Gordon Lithgow is a geneticist at the Buck Institute for Research on Aging in Novato, California. Manish Chamoli is a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute. Okay, so that team is working on the idea that aging may be at the heart of a constellation of age-related diseases. So if you treat one failure, such as the loss of healthy protein functioning, you might stop others and also prevent age-related diseases, including Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. But some scientists are taking more dramatic steps in the age-old fight against old age. Instead of curing diseases, Why not engineer resistance to disease and to aging itself directly into our genome? Hi, this is George Church. I'm a professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School, and I'm interested in talking about ways that we might reverse aging. We heard that the biological processes in worms and flies are the same as in humans, but that also applies to other animals, including the supersized. From one millimeter worms, we now zoom out to the 20 meter, at 66 foot, bowhead whale. The bowhead whale is a member of the right whale family, and geneticists such as George Church think it might be the right whale to help forestall our meeting with mortality. The bowhead is thought to be the longest-lived mammal, and even more, it remains disease-free for most of its life. Recently, scientists sequenced the whale's genome to see if they can explain 
just how it does this, but it's just one of the organisms that geneticists are studying. Eventually, they want to put a suite of Methuselah-like genes into our genome. This is synthetic biology. Genes of one organism are copied and added to those of another in order to get it to do something that it otherwise wouldn't do. We've altered the genome of simple organisms, such as the E. coli bacterium, but now we're scaling up. Dr. Church's book is Regenesis, How Synthetic Biology Will Reinvent Nature and Ourselves. A cutting-edge example of synthetic biology is changing the genetic code of an uh, industrial microorganism like E. coli so that it is resistant to all viruses and has new amino acid capabilities. Well, how do you do that? I mean, are you removing or adding genes the same way you would rearrange Lego blocks or something like that? Oh, uh, yeah, it has a lot in common with that metaphor. We uh, literally synthesize the DNA chemically on chips and then can assemble them automatically, essentially, in the lab and inside the organism. The organism will find it to the right place. In fact, it's better than Legos because it goes zooming in, uh, finds the right place, and pops one out and the other one in. So, I mean, it's sort of self-assembling Legos once you give it the right instructions? Exactly, self-assembling Legos. Yeah. <laughs> I like and it. And it all goes from the computer to organic chemistry to the self-assembly process. One thing that uh, is revolutionary and very recent is uh, the ability to do precise editing with uh, CRISPR. CRISPR, to me, that sounds like something that's down at the local chicken outlet. I, maybe you could <laughs> yes. tell, tell me what it is. Let's, let's, let's de-jargonize. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so CRISPR is uh, a molecular machine that is composed of one protein and one RNA, and the RNA searches throughout your entire genome of six billion base pairs, randomly testing out every position until it finds that one needle in a haystack place where it can land bind precisely and cut, and then either make a deletion or your favorite substitution. Well, George, I think most people are aware that we can re-engineer plants or bacteria. I mean, many of us have heard of genetically modified crops, after all, and the idea of making bacteria that could produce oil, for example, that's already been tried. But you write about the possibility of altering the human genome. E. coli, algae, they sound rather simple compared to us. How safe is it to swap in or out genes for humans? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, there's a lot of discomfort with genetically modified crops in, in Europe. It's embraced in many other countries. But in Europe, they've now approved uh, the use of genome engineering in human beings, so-called gene therapy. And there are about 2,000 clinical trials worldwide going on showing great progress in gene therapy since it's sort of dismal start point in 2003 when there were two deaths from uh, an oncogene that was activated. So what you're saying is that, in fact, this is a part of the world that's been rather cherry about the idea of genetic engineering, and yet they seem to be moving very far when it comes to humans. Yeah, I think the difference is that, that it's hard to see the advantage to the consumer for a slightly less expensive food. But it's easy to see with a devastating disease to see a miraculous cure. And so the bar is a little bit higher for the risks when the benefits are low, for, for example, with cheaper food. While if the benefit is obvious where you're curing a, a deadly disease which has no other cure. So I think that's, it makes sense to me that that's why they would embrace one and not the other. George, you're part of a team that's uh, sequenced the genome of the bowhead whale. Now, that's an animal that lives to, I don't know what, about a century or something like that? There's some evidence that some bowhead whales have lived over two centuries. My goodness. Well, okay. So that sounds like it could be of interest to humans who want to prolong their lifespans. How could that be of use to us? I mean, is it the thought that there's something in its genome that gives it longevity, or could it just be its lifestyle? Technically, it could be his lifestyle. But, I mean, you can see throughout the animal kingdom that there are animals that reproducibly have short lives and long lives. It's somewhat related to size. It's a bit of a paradox because one of the ways that you, that you die is uh, every time your cells divide and make more of you, uh, you take a risk that they will go out of control and cause cancer. But there's this paradox that some of the largest animals like whales and elephants 
live a long time without cancer and the bowhead whale lives considerably longer than many other whales so you know what we want to do is go beyond observations of the genome to tests where we can take the likely genes and then use CRISPR to put them into some other organism and look for you know, reduction in cancer rate or reversal of aging. Have you been able to identify what genes you need to, uh, as it were, transplant? I mean, if you transplanted these genes into me, I, I also wonder whether I would develop a liking for krill or something like that. I mean, how do you know you've got the right genes? Right. Well, so we have a short list of genes, some of which have been proven to be impactful on cancer or aging in animals like roundworms and fruit flies. And others uh, remain to be tested or remain to be tested in combination. So, for example, in elephants, they live for a long time without cancer, and they are known to ha now known to have many copies of the p53 gene. It's a protective agent. It's a tumor suppressor gene, and they have a, a ridiculous number of them, 40 or more copies, while humans have one copy per genome. And so that might be. Uh, something worthy of exploring to see if you can use it as a tumor suppressor in a preventative strategy. There are other genes that have been shown to act in reversal. So, for example, you can suture together a young mouse and an old mouse, and you find uh, rejuvenation of the skeletal muscle, the cardiac muscle, and the brain function in the older mouse. And then that's been hunted down to a particular gene, GDF11, which can act by itself to rejuvenate. So there's a short list of genes of this nature. Now, you've talked about mining the genomes of, of whales and mice and whatever. What about people uh, who seem to have protective alleles? They, they have a genetic code that allows them to smoke and drink and party on, and they live to 120. I mean, is, is there something to be mined there? Uh, certainly. So we, we're uh, part of a small consortium that has... Uh, a significant fraction of genomes of people that live past 110. There's about 70 people at any given moment on the planet that have lived past 110, and about half of them have been sequenced. And we're pouring over it. There's nothing publishable yet, but uh, it, I think it's one of many strategies for finding candidates, which we then test uh, in animal tests for aging reversal. What about the, the cures of you know common ills like the cold and so forth, other virus-borne diseases? I think you've talked about the possibility of uh, re reprogramming ourselves so that we don't get any of that. Right. Well, so we are we we have made one biotech organism which is uh, resistant to multiple viruses, and we have a strategy that should work in others. There are active gene therapies in humans to delete the receptors for viruses, like this, the CCR5 receptor for HIV, to make people resistant to HIV. And we're doing it in agricultural species, uh, making them virus resistant. So I think that we'll see more and more of this in the near future. When you tell people what you do for a living, I mean, do you ever get the response that, look, do we really know enough about how our genome works to, to be doing this? I mean, the idea that there's a single mutation somewhere causing cancer and so forth, I mean, all that went away when we actually sequenced uh, the genome and we're gonna learn more about it, the role of epigenetics, how the genes are expressed, all this. It sounds terribly complicated. Do, do we know enough to go forward here? Certainly there are complicated parts of, of our genome which we do not understand well enough to be messing with. There are other parts where we think we know enough you know, for example, if we can reverse the genetic problems in, in cystic fibrosis or Huntington's, those are simple cases with relatively little epigenetics. And then as we gain experience and sophistication, then we will go on to more complicated ones. So I think it's, it's like most technologies. You start with the low-hanging fruit, the things that are extraordinarily impactful and extraordinarily simple and you move on to more and more. Just, just like modern cars are considerably more complicated than the original ones. George Church, thanks so very much for speaking with us today. Thank you very much. George Church is a geneticist at Harvard Medical School, and he's the author of Regenesis, How Synthetic Biology Will Reinvent Nature and Ourselves. Well, will we one day be lining up to become a mishmash of the best genes that we can find in nature? Next. I'd like to pick up some jeans, please. All right, buddy, what can I get for you? Well, I'm thinking that I probably want to hit my stride on my 300th birthday. 
So I guess what I'll need are genes that protect against flu, heart disease, cancer, neurodegeneration. Yeah, sure, that's a standard package. Yeah, and I'd also like the bowhead whale gene, the one giant tortoise, and the protective alleles from that woman in France who's 112 and smokes cigars. Sounds good, a centenarian special. Oh, today only, buy two redwood tree genes and we'll throw in one for good parking karma. Reduces stress, extends life, that's what we found. Yeah, well, okay. And if it was me, I'd recommend a few upgrades. For example, this lovely allele here will protect you from dengue fever if you're traveling to the tropics. Well, I wasn't actually... And planned. here we got the bacterial spore that can go into stasis and lie dormant for 240,000 years and then be revived. It's useful when you're in line at the post office. You know what? <laughs> what the heck? I'll take them all. And while I'm at it, I I've always wanted to play the saxophone, like John Coltrane. Can you give me a suite of genes that code for jazz improv? Ah, uh, you want cognitive enhancement. That's two stalls down, next to the hair restoration kiosk. Well, we've looked at the science of keeping the body healthy, but what about the mind? Can we lengthen our life with our attitude? A remarkable psychological experiment with a group of septuagenarians turns their clock back 20 years. Next. It's Raising the Minimum Age on Big Picture Science. Big Picture Science is also supported in part by Podiversity. Podiversity offers easy access to ad-free podcasts on Android devices. Your subscription to Podiversity helps support the production of Big Picture Science and your other favorite podcasts. Follow your favorite shows and have new episodes downloaded automatically to your Android device. You can download Podiversity from the link at bigpicturescience.org or at podiversity.com. This scientist thinks that aging, at least in part, could be in our minds. Hi, I'm Ellen Langer, professor of psychology at Harvard University. To test what was a new theory that mindset may have an effect on aging, in 1981, Dr. Langer carried out an extraordinary experiment involving eight male volunteers in their 70s and early 80s. And this was a time when 80 was 80, not the new 60. So even those who were in their late 70s were old. They tended to shuffle when they walked. They didn't stand fully erect. They spoke slowly. So they were what would be equivalent to perhaps your stereotype of the 95-year-old today. Her idea was to put their minds back in time and then see if their bodies would follow. She took these men to a monastery that had been temporarily redesigned with the furniture, the music, the accoutrement, the ambiance needed to replicate the year 1959. When Dr. Langer did this experiment more than 30 years ago, the idea that the mind and body were linked, in fact were one, was considered fringe. It isn't anymore, in part due to her subsequent research and that of other scientists who have shown that your attitude affects your physical well-being. And this is more than the idea that anxiety gives you a stomach ache. Dr. Langer proposed that the mind-body connection is strong enough that we might be able to control disease and aging through our psychology. Today, she's the author of a dozen books and hundreds of research articles about mindfulness. But in 1981, when she ran the unconventional experiment with the septuagenarians and the octogenarians, the results were unexpected. Well, it really started back in the early 70s when I found that by giving elderly people plants and decisions to make, they live longer. And so that became very strange to me. How do you go from this simple change to longer life? And that was the beginning of this mind-body entity theory. And the mind-body entity theory, very simple. Most people don't realize that they live in a world where they believe in mind and body as separate, this dualism. And the question has always been, how do you get from this fuzzy thing called a thought to something material called the body. So what we did in a series of studies, starting with this counterclockwise study, was to put the mind back in time and take our measurements from the body. Okay, so you did the experiment. You took these guys to, I think it was a monastery? Some, yes. Some sort of retreat. You converted that into a living space that was designed to reprise 1959. Yes. When these guys would have been 22 years younger, so what, in their 40s or 50s, something like that? Yes, 20 We're, years younger. 20 years younger. So if we had stepped into those rooms, 
what would we have seen if we walked in with one of those guys? Yeah. Well, this was a low-budget operation, so you, you wouldn't have been overwhelmed with the change to make it 1959. We used a monastery, and what we really did was just remove the religious icons. We put up posters from that time period and books and magazines. The treatment was not so much walking into a Hollywood set, but rather it was through the discussions and the instructions to people. So, for example, at night they would watch a movie from that time, and the next day they would all discuss it, and they were instructed when they discuss it that they should be discussing the past in the present tense. And they were informed that for them it was 1959. Okay, and what about mirrors? Were there any mirrors that would uh, remind no. them that they, they weren't? Uh, you know, that's 50? what was so nice about it, that it started off as a monastery. So if you sort of imagine a place that has very few markers to lead us to think about ourselves. What, what did they do during the day, typically? I mean, can you describe it? They wake up in the morning and they're going to spend, what, five days there or something like that? Uh, what were they doing? They had discussions. They then went for walks. It wasn't full of physical activity. In fact, there was almost no physical activity. It was mostly just discussion groups where, for all intents and purposes, it is 1959. Any discussion they have has to be only up to 1959, and 1959, 58, 57, whatever they're discussing, has to take place in the present tense. And they would talk about things that were current at that time. I mean, yes, and then they're, you know, and they would read the magazines that were out, and if they wanted to read the books. Yeah. So the death of Buddy Holly or the Sputnik right. launch of a couple of years early, that kind of stuff. Right. All right. So. Five days of this, and then they walk out. You test them all again, right? And and uh, what what had happened? Well, it was uh, very, very interesting to me that the change was almost palpable from, from really from the very beginning. Once they were out of the clutches of the loving families, friends, and community that told them that they were old. But you got some quantitative data on them as well, right? For I mean, sure. Grip strength, hearing, vision, that kind of stuff? Yes, we took... Um, many, many measures before we began the study. We even photographed them, and then we repeated these measures at the end of the study. And the results were in some ways remarkable. What we found was an improvement in vision and hearing, in grip strength, in gait. They stood more erect. There were improvements on cognitive abilities. And in, in virtually all ways, they seemed to have improved and we can say in some sense gotten younger. We took the photographs again at the beginning of the study and then at the end, and then we had people who had no idea what the research was about evaluate the photographs. And those who were in the experimental group were seen as younger, looking younger than they did at the outset. Well, that's remarkable. And I have to say, and this may be my bias being in a physical science, that, you know, you want a mechanism that could explain this, that, uh, you know, how is it that just by, if you will, make believe we're going to go back to where we were 22 years ago, that suddenly yeah. our bodies follow. How, okay. how do you explain sure. that? Sure. Well, let me appeal to your medical knowledge that you accept probably without any trouble, which is placebos. And you know that virtually all diseases that you give people a placebo and probably a third of the people or close to that will get better. Well, how is that happening? So it, it's the same mechanism that you don't need a mechanism. You don't need a mediator when you have this mind-body unity. Now, of course, things are going on on the physiological level. The question that you're asking is, well, does A lead to B and B lead to C? And I think that the initiation of these physical changes starts off simultaneously. And then you're going to have different physiological uh, sequences. I'm not expert enough to speak to that. How long did the changes last? I mean, was this a permanent fix, or did they revert yeah, back yeah, to their... Yeah, no, that's, that's a wonderful question, and I must say that I was remiss at the time. I didn't go back and do the follow-ups. When I thought to do the follow-ups, it was already a few years later, and it wasn't... Uh, I didn't do it. But 
I think that all of the subsequent data, and we have quite a bit testing this mind-body entity theory, would suggest that if these people go home and they're treated again, infantilized and treated by the world around them, leading them to believe that they're only going to get worse, that they're 80 years old, their strongest parts of their life are surely over, they would go back to being like that. For the few, if there were any, and again, this I don't know, but I would assume if they went back into those old environments and changed the environment to support this new person, this new view of who they can be, then it would have maintained itself. Now, I'm not arguing that whatever changes could occur are going to go on indefinitely. What I am arguing is that we really don't know how long one can stay active, alert, and healthy. You, you've done some other experiments that seem to confirm the fact that you, you really had found a, a real effect here. Maybe very briefly, you could just tell me what you did with the, the hotel chambermaids. So for the chambermaid study, the first thing we did was ask these women, how much exercise do you get? And turns out they said they don't get any exercise. Well, that's interesting because all they're doing is exercising. They don't get any exercise because they think exercise is what you do after work, as it is for many white-collar workers. Now, if exercise is good for your health, then these women who are exercising all day long should be healthier, one would think, than socioeconomically equivalent others. Turns out they are no healthier, in some ways less healthy. Okay, so now we do the study where all we're going to do simply is teach half of them to see their work as exercise. So we explain to them making a bed is like working on this or that machine at the gym and so on. And we show them enough of this. They're persuaded their work is exercise. Now um, we've taken all of our measures. We come back later, and uh, the first thing we want to find out is, have they changed their behavior? Are they working any harder? So we ask them, they're not working any harder. We ask the people who work with them, is she working any harder? We ask them, are they eating any differently? To their minds, they're not eating. There's no difference on any of these. The only difference is that now they see their work as exercise. Now we take the important measures, and what we find is because of this change in mindset, we get a significant change in weight, in waist-to-hip ratio, body mass index, and their blood pressure came down. So, in fact, just changing their attitude about their lives changed, well, changed their physical state. I mean, it's, 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 it's mind over matter, isn't it? Yes, it is, which means eventually we should be able to figure out how to control disease, and I think most diseases, through our psychology. We're not there yet, but it's a very hopeful start. Well, we've heard earlier in this show about biomedical efforts to slow aging with, you know, focus on everything from telomeres to stem cells. How do you see your work fitting into that kind of thing? I mean, are How we do gonna... I see their work fitting into mine? Well, oh, yes, I guess that, okay. that's the correct perspective <laughs> here. Um, well, I, on some of these studies now, we will be assessing telomeres that clearly when there are changes on any level, there are changes on every level. So that when we get people to be able to improve cognitively, physically, to look younger and so on, there are corresponding physical changes. And it's nice to find those telomeres are just one of those measures. You would like to apply your uh, method here, if you can call it a method, if that's the correct term, it's, it sounds like a whole new approach, to defeating cancer, for example. Uh, how could mindfulness take on a cancerous cell? Do you think uh, you need to know how that works, or are you just going to see if it does work? Well, <laughs> we're going to see if it does work first. The way we're going to do that is to test this mind-body entity theory where we take women, put them back in time before they had the cancer and see what happens. Going forward, we don't need to, um, all of these studies are designed to say, wait a second, we have enormous control over our health. The work on these mind-body entity theories and all of the research on placebos certainly speaks to the amount of control we do have. I take it that you use this yourself. 
Yes, all the time. <laughs> Ellen Langer, thank you so very, very much for being with us today. My pleasure. Alan Langer is a professor of psychology at Harvard University. Well, it's really amazing the potential for fighting disease through our psychology. Yeah, well, I have to say, you know, I have this mechanistic view of disease, and yet, you know, you wouldn't argue the fact that maybe your kidneys can affect your heart or vice versa. Well, it looks like your brain can affect things, too. Throughout the show, what we've learned is that there are all these different approaches to combating Aging. I was trying to think of a good euphemism. Do you have one? Aging? No, no, no. It's just maturation. I mean, it's good. Okay. And maturation is a good euphemism. But from understanding how proteins work and then stop working to isolating these genes that could protect us against disease to understanding the role of psychology, uh, we could at least say that the science of aging is still young. Yeah, and full of promise. The, the trouble is we should have reached this point 100 years ago. I, I would have felt much better about it had we done so. So you're wishing that the science of aging was old. Yes, because then we might know how to really stop it. Well, thanks to the mature yet youthful talents that helped produce this show, Gary Niederhoff and Barbara Vance. Also thanks to financial support from Rena Shulsky david and Sammy David and the NASA Astrobiology Institute. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, where scientists study the origin and nature of life. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to Raising the Minimum Age. And if you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science, you can find it on our archive on our website, bigpicturescience.org. And if you're a podcast listener, but you prefer listening to over-the-air radio because it reminds you of your youth, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station's not on that list, well, from Sarah letting them know you like the show. Oh, do you have a comment, a criticism, maybe a suggestion, maybe some faint praise? Well, email it all to bigpicturescience at seti.org. Oh, and I also got a gene that lets you sit on the couch and eat donuts, all while your cholesterol goes down.